I have um, the unique privilege, like the last time I was here, it was quite a while ago, I think it was about maybe a year ago, about a year ago or so, I um, always enjoy coming here, I feel like I'm coming home in a lot of ways, but uh, I had another grandchild since the last time I was here, so uh, amen, amen. <laughs> I can't believe that I actually have four grandsons now, actually four grandsons and two granddaughters, and I am so blessed, I never imagined that I would, uh, that I would be a grandfather like six times, it's like, am I really getting that old? I met somebody earlier, the, just a little bit in the service, and I, I married them. And they, I said, how long has it been now? 19 years. I'm like, 19 years? That 19 years has gone by that quickly? Uh, but what a joy to actually be here with you. I'm going to put this Bible right here this morning. I don't think I needed it. Um, I got the iPad going. I'd like you to turn to Habakkuk. 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 No, I didn't sneeze. I didn't say my back aches. Uh, this is an Old Testament uh, minor prophet, so I want you to go, if you have your iPad, your Bible, your phone, you can go there, just make sure your phones are turned off, but, and, and if you don't go there, that's okay, we'll project it up on the screen, but this is a Bible that, uh, a passage in Scripture that I think is important for us to take a look at. As you're turning there, let me just say a couple things here this morning. First of all, <clears throat> we are in the middle of summer, and one of my favorite summer holidays is actually the 4th of July. And um, usually, you know, there's uh, a lot of fireworks that go off. Those are fun. Here they're there, right? You hear the M80s going off. They're not all that fun. But if you're a kid, you, you, like, to, you like to do that, right? But <clears throat> July 4th is a big, big day. It's a lot of fun. Most people are off work. We're barbecuing, right? We've got the arancetta going. We've got the hot dogs going, the hamburgers frying. The kids, it's hopefully a hot day. The kids are out playing. The flags are going. It's just a, it's just a great time. It's summertime. It's hot. Uh, watermelon, just the whole thing. It's just, it's just kind of a fun day. There's usually some unique desserts that have a kind of patriotic colors and that kind of thing. It's just a, a fun day. It's the 4th of July. Where there's parades. Everybody loves going to a parade, right? Uh, you, get, you go to a parade, and <clears throat> the kids in particular love it. I, I think of my four grandsons. <clears throat> I'm sure that they'll eventually uh, want to go to a parade. And, and, you know, for a little boy to see a fire truck, you know what that's like? You know, he's about this tall, and the fire truck's like, <clears throat> and it's red, and the sirens are typically going, or the lights are flashing, and there's firemen. And the firemen are like heroes to a little kid. You see the police cars maybe and the marching band and the people twirling things and it's just fun. Everybody's out there in their lawn chairs. It's a great time. It's July 4th. It's, it's America's birthday and we're, we're having a great time. Anticipating a parade. Great. It's great. Until somebody gets shot in the chest. It's great until Cooper Roberts takes one to the chest and his spine is severed and he's now paralyzed for the rest of his life. Highland Park shooting. Guy camps up on a roof. Fires off 70, 80 rounds. Picks off people like they're targets. Hits a mom and a dad. Kills them both. Leaves a two-year-old orphan. M.J. Moultrie. You may have never even heard of that name. Ten months ago. In Woodlawn, just, just southeast of here. Came in from Alabama to be with his mom. Four years old, getting his hair braided. Sitting in the apartment sitting on mom's lap, getting his hair braided. Stray bullet comes flying into the house, strikes him and kills him. Yeah. So you ready to go deep today? Ready to go someplace that's not easy? You need to go there. We need to go there. We need to face the violence that's happening in our city, in Chicago land. A 
July 4th, I'm hearing reports of this mass shooting, another one, and flashbacks of Uvalde, Texas, where a shooter went into the school and killed a bunch of elementary children, just cold-blooded killed them. And I'm like, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not liking it, I'm not liking how it feels. Maybe because I'm a grandpa now. You know, it t hits a little closer. I'm like, Tuesday morning, July 5th, I wake up like I normally do, go to my office, I'm praying, and I'm asking God questions. Like, what's going on? I've known God long enough to ask him questions respectfully, but I'm asking them passionately. I'm just having a heart-to-heart -heart with him, I mean. And it, it, it was quite an emotional moment. I felt like God was saying, you need to go to the book of Habakkuk. You need to hear how I interacted with my prophet Habakkuk. And so it begs the question this morning, which I think we all need to answer, how does a Christian, how do we as people of God respond to repeated, yes, repeated and senseless, yes, senseless, irrational violence in our culture today? How do we respond to it? What do we do? You should listen this morning because I want to give you, I want to instigate within you a journey that will keep you from sticking your head in the sand in fear and cause you to engage theologically and give you the ability to process biblically the violent injustice that's taking place in our culture today. I want you to walk out of here with the right thoughts of God who hasn't changed, who was righteous and holy through the backdrop of violence? And how do you reconcile a good God with violence? So I'm not afraid to talk about that this morning. I tremble because I want to speak well of God. So how do we respond to repeated and senseless violence? There's a lot of questions I mean, life is filled with questions, isn't it? Life is filled with questions, and the answer all the time doesn't come in a pretty little box wrapped up with a nice little bow. And sometimes you don't even get an answer, or at least the answer that you want to hear. And sometimes when an answer doesn't come, and the question remains unanswered, it evokes within us different responses. And some people choose to respond to unanswered questions by allowing the silence to nag them. By allowing the silence to destroy their spirit with haunting doubts. Or some people choose to live with their doubts and just kind of harden their heart and move on with life and Try to forget about it. As long as it doesn't affect me or anybody I know or my family directly, I'm just going to kind of move on with life and just, it's almost like sticking your head in the sand and not engaging something that's so relevant and important to engage and something that the Bible doesn't hide from but addresses directly. But how often do we read the book of Habakkuk? Yeah, I have my devotions in Habakkuk. It's hard to even pronounce Habakkuk. When I say Habakkuk, some of you think I'm saying I have a backache, right? Or you think I'm seizing Habakkuk. Oh, excuse you. God bless you, Pastor. No, I said Habakkuk. And then there are those that don't get questions answered, and they get hardened, or they're jaded, or they just get cynical and say there's no God. And yet some... Some choose, not the negative options, but to actually engage in questions. And I think part of the way that we process 
the violence that's very real to each one of us. I mean, this is not just, it's not just like it's not real. Any, it's, this is, we're in the game now. This, it's a foot. Our culture is upside down. Let's just face it. On, on a lot of different levels, it's upside down. Let's just all really be honest with each other. It's, it's, it's upside down. So let's face it. Let's become equipped as the people of God to stare at it in the face and learn how to process it or to see how God looks at it and how he uses it for his greater purposes. See, the first point is in processing this senseless violence is to not be afraid to ask questions. I think that's the right way to go. So that's my first point, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. There's only three chapters in Habakkuk. You need to read this book. And you look at it, again, every time I preach, I don't preach just to feed you, and that's good. And that was a nice supper, Pastor John. That was a nice lunch on Sunday. I don't have any more responsibility now to go. No. You come to church to gain more responsibility. You come to church to learn and be introduced to the Word of God. If you come here with the expectation that your pastor is going to unpackage everything for you every Sunday for 45 minutes and be able to fully feed you, you're wrong. You need to get into the word yourself and start studying. So let this instigate you. But the first thing that we do when we go to handle violence is that we are asking questions. It's, it's okay to ask God questions. Now, it's not okay to put your fist up in the air and say, why God? And then write them off and disrespect him. I've been around long enough to be like Habakkuk, who was a prophet of God, who when he questioned God, he did it with a level of respect. So it's this conversation with God, like July 5th, Tuesday morning in my office, God, I'm struggling right now. I mean, it's one thing, God, for, you know, I'm grandpa now. If I get shot, you know, okay. But for Cooper to get shot? For the two parents to leave an orphan two-year-old to get, we're, we're God, where do you fit in in all this? Uvalde, kids scared to death, man, hiding behind their desks. But do yourself a favor. Read the stories of the, of the people and the lives that were affected. Don't stick your head in the sand. And when you talk to God about this, what you're doing is you're praying. And you're saying, God, Here's my heart. I want to give you a little secret about prayer. Prayer is praying your heart. There's a lot of people who pray all over this world every day, very religious people. And it's kind of like an act of religion as opposed to, it's like a duty that's fulfilled. Pray so many prayers so many times so that you get a certain amount of forgiveness and you name it. Or do your ritual every, you know, every day and, and you check off the marks that you're a good boy or a good girl. I'm talking about praying your guts to God. Praying your heart to God. When you stop praying your heart, you stop praying. You're just going through a ritual. So I'm going to ask God, I'm struggling here, Lord, with the violence I'm seeing in my city, in my country. I'm struggling with a world that is upside down, God, on a lot of levels here. And I respectfully pray my heart to you. I mean, Habakkuk is recording a prophet's dialogue with God concerning questions like, why does God seem indifferent in the face of evil? He's asking questions like, why do evil people seem to get away with their evil going unpunished? And the prophet's bringing these questions before God. In every prophetic book, it's usually God downloading his instructions to the people. But here, in Habakkuk, there's questions that are going up before God, and God is answering in the form of an oracle back to the prophet, Habakkuk. And he's saying, here's my oracle. Here's my answer. Write it down. 
write it in stone, write it strong, so that it may be dispensed to the people when they hear my answer to your questions about violence, Habakkuk. So he offers his first question. And I call it a question, but some theologians say it was a complaint. And I would tend to agree with them, but boy, I have a hard time, I have a hard time before a holy God complaining before him. But let's call it a complaint. But it's not like a complaint where I have enmity to God, but it's a, it's a if you read these questions that I'm going to read here in a second, you can't just look at them like, God's, like, like Habakkuk saying, you know, God, why do you... Why do you uh, look, look at traitors like you don't care? Why do you let me see violence? He's not saying it that way. He's, uh, there's passion. There's passion. I mean, there's, oh, Lord, how, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. God, why are you allowing this? Why are you letting me see it? It's repulsive to me. That's his complaint. That's his question. And I bet you if I raise, had you raise hands, how many of you would like to ask that same question? I know I would put my hand up and say yes. And it would be so much easier for me just to talk about the Beatitudes, for goodness sake. Let's talk about Jesus calming the storm this morning. Everybody will be happy, and I'll probably get several applauses this morning. No, I have a burden on my heart this morning. I have a burden this morning. And God answers. God answers in verse 5 through 11. Let's look at verse 5. Habakkuk asks these questions, and the Lord answers. Here comes the oracle. Here comes the answer from God. Verse 5, Habakkuk, look among the nations and see. Open your eyes, buddy. Look around with spiritual discernment, something that believers have the ability to do, to discern spiritual things to see the times and understand the signs of the times like a weatherman would understand the signs in the sky to to predict a storm coming. So also Habakkuk, spiritual man, people of God, look and open your eyes. Look among the nations. Look around you. Wonder and be astounded as you look. For I am doing a work in your days, Habakkuk, I am doing a work in your days, Chicagoans, that you would not believe if it was told to you. Frankly speaking, Habakkuk, if I told you really what I'm doing, you wouldn't be able to swallow it. You wouldn't even be able to believe it. You would have a hard time processing it. But since you ask me, let's go. Since you ask me, let's talk about it. Because I think God really cares. I think God really deeply, deeply cares about what's going on in this world today. So he says in verse 6, he says, look around, verse 5, look at the nations. I'm going to do a work that's beyond what you would ever believe. I'm raising up the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, these ruthless people. Now, to understand this in a better way is that <clears throat> Habakkuk was among a people, the people of Israel, Judah, who had abandoned God, who had committed adultery on God, meaning that they had flirted around and devoted themselves and all their affections of heart to idols that are usually well, not usually, always backed by demons. They're not innate. They can't speak, they can't talk, but boy, they're devastating. And they had abandoned the true God, and they had gone to idols. And so God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. I'm raising up that ruthless and impetuous people 
who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings that are not their own. I'm raising up a violent nation. I'm, I'm allowing them to grow. I'm allowing them to prosper. I'm allowing their evil. I'm allowing it. And we see in the end that God uses the Babylonians to discipline the people of God, that they would turn their eyes and hearts back to God, and they went into what was called the Babylonian captivity. But the point is that God is in his providence, the sovereign God who's ruler over all the earth, he's king of the universe, is working providentially. That means that he has purpose, it's, it's purposeful sovereignty. I know I'm using some theological terms here, but you're, you're mature enough if you're here at Midway to know those terms. He's using his providence and allowing a violent nation to arise, and he's going to use that to accomplish his will. God allows. Listen this morning. God allows for his purposes, but never authors evil. Wow. Are you serious, Pastor John? Hear me right. I didn't say that God created evil. What I'm saying is that God allows evil for his greater purposes. Jesus himself was treated very evilly, wasn't he? He was beaten, whipped, beaten beyond recognition, mocked, spit on, beard pulled, whipped, beaten beyond recognition, so anemic from loss of blood that he couldn't even carry the cross himself. Hands pierced, feet pierced, thirsty. I mean, it was violence. It was a violent thing that occurred. But God never authors evil. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 1, 5, it says this, this is the message we have heard, speaking of the righteousness of God, defending the righteousness of God. John, the apostle, says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's no darkness in God. He is light. And then in James 1, 13, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So get it right. There may be evil in our world. God doesn't author that, but God's not going to waste it. He's not going to let it just happen. God takes evil that we do on our own initiative as evil people, and he turns it around for his good. You remember the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 50? He was hanging out with his fam, his brothers. They were all shepherd boys. They went out to tend to the sheep. They went far from the house. They were so jealous of Joseph. You know why? Because Joseph was a daddy's boy. He was treated special. He had some favoritism going his way. And they didn't like Joseph. They were jealous of Joseph. Joseph had a special jacket from his pop. It was a colorful coat. And Joseph had dreams about his brothers serving him, and he was so stupid that he told the brothers the dreams. Hey, I had a dream, guys, that you were worshiping me. I mean, who's going to receive that? Nobody. It's like, so when they got the opportunity, these guys were bitter. When they got the opportunity, what did they do? They did evil. They didn't just, you know, mock their brothers. They hated this guy. So they took him, and they were going to kill him. That was their plan. They were going to be so violent they would murder him. But one of the older brothers spoke up and said, hey, let's not do that. Let's just take his colorful coat, which we all are so jealous of, rip it up, put some goat blood on it, take it back to dad and tell dad, hey, Joseph got eaten up by a violent animal. But what they did, so they did all that, but what they did is they took Joseph and Giuseppe, it's my Italian heritage coming out, threw him in the well and then sold him off to a band of traveling folks that were going into Egypt and they sold him off into slavery, and he spent years in Egypt. He became a leader in Egypt after being imprisoned there. And this is what, and then after time had passed, and the brothers came back 
through various circumstances, came back into Egypt because they needed food. Joseph saw his brothers and listened to what he said. He said in verse 20 of chapter 50, Genesis, you brothers, you plotted evil against me. You you performed violence on me. You plotted evil against me. You intended evil, but God turned it into good. God turned it into good in order to preserve the lives of many people who are alive today because of what happened. What you thought was evil against me, God turned it around. Amen? God turned it around. He didn't author it, but he turned it around and he redeemed that evil. Just like he will do in our society today. I mean, this is the theme throughout Scripture. You see it in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All things, not some things, all things. Wealth and poverty, health and sickness, violence and peace. God works it all together for good. He's God. And we aren't. We aren't. I like what Isaiah 46.10 says. Isaiah 46.10 says this. I like the resolve. I like the confidence. I like that God knows who he is and what he's about. And he, he communicates that he's in control, whether you understand it or not. He says, declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I have ordained the end and the means to get us there. And if violence occurs in that journey, I will turn it around to get us to that place. And what is that that end that he's he's ordained? The end is in verse 14 of Habakkuk 2. Listen to what it says. For the earth, here's where we're headed. Here's where we're going. Here's the ordained ends. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There will be a day where the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. We will not even need the sun to shine. It will be the brightness of the glory of God and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will be as the waters that cover the sea. I'm taking us there. I've said what I will say and I will do what I have ordained to do and nothing will keep me from getting us there. And then he says something that I think is so profound, and I take great comfort in this, because I do not want the guilty to go unpunished. I'm with you. I want something done. And the fact that God, well, let's read it. He says to Habakkuk in verse 11, chapter 2, he says, let me be clear, Habakkuk. These men that This nation, Babylon, the Babylonians, they're guilty. They're guilty. And I just want you to know, Habakkuk, you have a complaint about the violence and the guilt. I want you to know that I know. Now we both know that they are guilty. So I'm a righteous God. You're a righteous prophet. You have a complaint. And I just want you to know, open your eyes, look around. I'm the sovereign God. I'm doing something here that you're not even going to believe. And by the way, I want you also to know that I know that those People are guilty. They're not going to get away with it. I see their guilt, and woe to them that shed innocent blood. Woe to them. Woe to violent people. Not to just shoot bullets, but to smack around their wives and speak violent words. Woe to you. He says, and he describes them, he says, and you tell me, As I read this, you tell me if this resonates and looks a bit like our culture today. He says in verse 11, Then they, the evil men, 
they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God, small g. These are guilty men. They sweep by like the wind they, and go on. In other words, they sweep in with no regard to life, do their, do their violence, and then go on. And they're guilty. They swing in. They drive by. They drive by. Do their violence. Impetuous people. Impulsive without any thought of the results or the outcome of their bullets that fly. They're wicked and evil. They sweep by, it says in the text here, and I'm looking, that sounds like a drive-by to me. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. That's a drive-by. They do their violence. They physically hurt. They kill. They say rotten, evil Violent filled words, they get their revenge, wipe their mouth, and go on like nothing happened. Yeah, yeah, shot those guys, yeah, did my thing. Some bullets, spray, stray bullets flew some different around. I was out and in broad daylight, shooting down a block, not even caring where those bullets will go. And then, yeah, that's over with. Yeah, it's good, man. It's, it's us, it's who we are. It's our, our might is our God, our strength, our ability who we are as a gang or who we are as a people or whatever you want to identify yourself with, all I know is that the Bible says that you swung by and that you're guilty before God. And I take comfort in that because now I know that God knows that I'm struggling too with the guilt that I see in the world. And when God says, I see the guilty, and he calls him guilty, do you think that a righteous God who gave up his son is going to let the wicked slide by? It ain't going to happen. They reject Christ. They will pay and meet the wrath of God. Amen. <laughs> Whose own might is their God? How often we see that pattern today? Where our own might is our God. It's like, you know, we, we can figure this out. We can do this together. Uh, we, we, can, we can somehow by our own strength and our own ability and our own ingenuity and our own intelligence and our own policy can create our own utopian world. We can make it better we don't want to deal with God. We don't want God's advice on it. We don't want to hear what God has to say about it because what we know it's best. So we can, we can put God to the side. We can put the Ten Commands to the side. We can put the promises of God to the side. We don't want anybody telling us or pushing their agenda on us. I don't want anybody that I'm going to be accountable to do. Why? Because I know what's best. Because we know what's best. Because our might is our own God. That is dangerous territory. I like what Alistair Begg said. He said, our problem is that we have a high view of self and a low view of God. You want to take God out of every element of our society? Well, welcome to the consequences of it all. Take a look around. Take a look around. And then he asks the second question, Chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Habakkuk asks another question. He says, you are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? How, how can you do this, God? So, so here Habakkuk boldly asks God questions, but also does it with a humility. So the way we process Senseless violence is we ask God questions, but we do it with a humility, and we choose a disposition of listening with expectation. So I'm asking God very passionately some very legitimate questions, but I'm also doing it. I mean, Habakkuk was a man of God, so he's doing it with a sense of fear and intrepidation before God. He's doing it with a sense of anticipation, with expectation that God will answer him in this moment. 
And God certainly does. He answers them. And this oracle that was given hundreds, thousands of years ago, look at how relevant it is to us today. It's an oracle that speaks through eternity. Speaks from hundreds of years ago right into where we're at today. So Habakkuk listens to God. That's the second thing. It's okay to speak and ask questions, but also listen. Listen with a sense of expectation. Habakkuk positions himself to expectantly wait on God. That's what we need to do. We ask God questions, but we don't just ask God questions and then spin around in our own strength and our own ability and in our own might and walk away. That's not right. That's not fair. We don't, we don't ask God difficult questions and spin around like we've already had the answers and we're upset with him. Why'd you let this? Why'd you let it? I don't really believe in you anymore. Give me, a chance to, to, give me a chance to answer you, hot shot. Get over here and let me talk to you. Let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, very obvious, let's reason together and I'll wash that away. But, but we got to talk. I think God's brought some of you here this morning just because he needs to have a talk with you. You've allowed life and all its harshness to harden your heart, and you have become cynical. You're listening online this morning. You've grown cynical. You've dialed in this morning, not by some kind of coincidence. God has ordained that you listen to this message today. Yes, you that's sitting right there in your living room watching today. You're watching because you're supposed to be watching and supposed to be listening this morning. Because God's got something for you. So we listen to God. Habakkuk positions himself to expectantly wait. He said, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk in chapter two, verse one, he's saying, I'm going out to the watch post I'm going out and I'm going to listen. I'm humbly asking God these questions and I'm listening now and positioning myself that I would hear God. And he goes up into the watchtower. The watchtower was a place that was common in Israel. They were typically built in vineyards. And they were built in the middle of a vineyard or on the edge of a vineyard made of stone high. And the farmer would go up, the owner of the vineyard would go up into that tower and he would look over the vineyard when his, when his grapes were ripe to make sure that nobody was stealing them. These were big vineyards, acres long, and so they were able to see out. But prophets also used the watchtower. They were known as a place of refuge. They were known as a place to be able to look out across the horizon, look across the vista, and see, oh, there's enemies that are coming, and we have one up on them now because they're not taking us by surprise because we went up into the watchtower. And so, so he's going up into the watchtower like a prophet typically would with the whole disposition that I'm waiting to hear from God. I'm actually waiting to hear what God has to say. But he does it. He asks the questions passionately, but he still humbly, and expect, humbly waits and expects to hear from God. I wonder sometimes about us. How patient are we? on waiting for God and his answer. Seriously, especially when innocence meets violence. Especially when health becomes sickness. Especially when loved ones become unjustly hurt or abused, how patient are we then to listen to God expectantly? Well, God answers Habakkuk again in verse 3, 2 and 3, 2, 3 and 4, God answers and says to Habakkuk, and the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. 
God's saying, I'm going to give you this now, and I want you to write it down on a tablet. I want you to write it down so it's real plain. I want you to write it down so everybody can read it. I want you to write it down so that, I may, so that you may give it to the, to the carrier, and he may run and tell everybody about it. Let's get some movement on this, Habakkuk. You want an answer? Here's the oracle. Here's the answer. Write it down. Evil and injustice may seem to have the upper hand in the world, and God is giving his answer now. I wonder how this relates to our lives in the sense that when we see that evil and injustice seem to have the upper hand, we, we feel angry and discouraged, right? Like Habakkuk. And we ask, how long are you going to keep and put up with this violence, God? How long are you going to put up with this upside-down world? And God gives the answer. And I think it's the same answer that God gave Habakkuk he would give us. He says to Habakkuk, be patient. Be patient. Look what it says in verse 3. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It will not prove false. What God is saying to Habakkuk here is, Habakkuk, write it down. The, 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 the vision is still there. The vision is what? That the knowledge of the glory of God will be known throughout the whole earth. That's, I've ordained that that would happen. That's still there. And it awaits what? It awaits its appointed time. In my perfect timing, in my appointed time, it will come. And it hastens to the end. We're catapulting closer and closer to God saying, I am going to set the record straight. The end will come, is what God's saying. And it will come with me setting the record straight. And when I enter into human history again, I'm going to enter to change human history. And I will establish my kingdom of righteousness and justice forevermore. And there will be no more sorrow, no more tear. Amen. So he says to him, write it down. Write it down, Habakkuk. The vision's coming for its appointed time. It will not lie. It will not prove false. It's going to happen. I've ordained the end as I've ordained the means to get us there. And if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So God's saying, look, the knowledge of my glory and my righteousness, despite the evilness that's going on and the violence in the world, that's coming. But in my sovereignty... You at this particular time need to wait on me for the perfect timing. Now, God isn't saying that we shouldn't stand up and speak against violence that we see in our city. God isn't saying that we should disengage and stick our head in the sand and be pacifists. There's times where we need to step up. There's times where we need to speak up. There's times where we need to be the peacemakers that God has called us to be. But in this context, and in the midst of Habakkuk's society of violence, and in the, and in the midst of Habakkuk's line of questioning, he's saying to Habakkuk, I have a plan and a design. I am the sovereign God, and in my providence, I will work all things together for good. But you need to be still for a moment and, and allow me to do what I need to do. And so what I'm asking is, God, I don't want to wait anymore. I'm going to shoot straight with you guys. I don't want to wait, especially when a kid gets his spine severed at a parade, visiting the parade with his twin brother. As soon as he wakes up from the first surgery, he's asking for his brother and his dog. He's a kid. He's eight years old. God, I want an answer now. <laughs> but he's God. I have to have a high view of him. I'm not God. So I ask, how do I wait? How do I? And then God nails it here. And this is where you really need to listen. This is probably the most important part, what I have to say this morning. 
God uses a compare-contrast literary tool to communicate what he's trying to communicate when it comes to waiting on him. When it comes to an abiding trust in him, he uses this literary tool, compare and contrast. So look at verse 4. The first part of verse verse 4, he says this, chapter 2. He says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. That's one. But the righteous shall live by his faith. That's two. So on one hand, in verse 4, God contrasts the person who can't patiently wait. He can't patiently hold up to the chaos and to the injustice and to the violence and he, he exposes that person by, by exposing their guiding principle. And their guiding principle is self-reliance. That's what he's saying on one hand. He's saying, behold, his soul is puffed up. When your soul is puffed up, what is it? You're walking in pride. You're walking in individualism. And when the violence hits and the chaos hits, you can't hold up to it because in your own strength and in your own ability and your own power, you're trying, to, you're trying to find a solution somehow to something that only God can solve. And you're not, your spirit's not right within you when you're trying to figure it all out on your own. But the righteous, on the other hand, shall live by faith. So in the midst of violence and in the midst of chaos, in the midst of an upside-down world, and in the midst of mixed up values in our society today, God is saying that the righteous, that my people live by a different guiding principle than self-reliance, and their guiding principle is that they walk by faith. They believe me against the odds. They believe me when it is the most difficult to believe. They remain obedient to me when all and everything within them wants to disobey and write them off. They walk by faith. And I'm more convinced than ever of the significance of the righteous walking by faith. That is your and our guiding principle. The righteous shall live by faith. And Paul taught this in the book of Romans. And Paul taught this in the book of Galatians. And the writer of Hebrews taught this in chapter 10. Listen to this one. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And then he adds, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The righteous shall live by faith. And without faith, it is Impossible, impossible to please God. <laughs> Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I don't think it's any coincidence that throughout the whole Bible, the exhortation to live by the divine guiding principle of faith is given and always mentioned in the midst of turmoil in the midst of pain, in the midst of uncertainty. I mean, read Hebrews 11 again. It's the chapter of faith. It's the hall of fame of faith. Every incident of faith being expressed in the hall of faith, chapter 11, Hebrews, every one of those is a people that's struggling through it. Some are given a promise that they never see fulfilled. They die without ever receiving the fulfillment of the promise, but they still believe God for it, and it is accounted unto them as righteousness, Abraham. Some are sawn in two. Some are destitute. Some are reviled. Some re receive the dead back to life. But it's all by faith, see? And that's what you've got to get, because the the, the, the world's crazy right now. Let's just be honest with ourselves. The world's in chaos. It's upside down. And I'm not being a doom and gloom preacher. It's my one time to come here. I might see you in another year from now. And here I am giving you this doom and gloom message. No. It's a message of hope. But what I'm trying to tell you is that your faith is so important that you need to nurture it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. 
If you are not in the word, if you're not reading, if you're not praying, if you're not seeking God in times like this, then you never will. You never will. And now is the time for you to be digging in. Now is the time for you to be praying. Now is the time to be advocating for your kids, lifting them up in prayer, fasting for them, seeking the face of God, repenting of your sins, living seriously for God 100%, forgiving your, your enemies, blessing those, holding no resentments, living 100% and surrender to God, not caring what other people think or what they happen to say. You live 100% for God and nurture that faith that's within you. I'm glad I got a couple hours this morning. <laughs> Just kidding. Faith is what guides our lives, especially in days of violence and relativity and militant cultural ideas that seek to influence our children. You connect that dot, you know what I'm talking about. So who do we turn to in days of calamity? Who do we turn to to nurture our faith? Who do we listen to in times of stress? Who are we giving our ear to? Who are we allowing our affections to be drawn to? To our own solutions? To our own abilities? To our own governing powers? Or to God? You see, the people, they went to idols. They went to man-made creation. They relied on their own strength. And God said, can they give guidance? Can your silver and gold covered idols provide any guidance for you? Do they have any breath in them? Do they have any ounce of ability to move you in the right direction as to what I'm trying to do in this world? Do they have any ability to illuminate you of what I'm trying to accomplish in the end? No, they don't. So God says, I'm the answer. I'm the one you should listen to. And the way I want you to listen is to look up and see, verse 20, that I am in my holy temple, that I am in position in the place of worship, that I am positioned in the place of governance, that I am the righteous and holy king of the universe. And all nations will know it, and the, all the earth will be silent before me. That's right. In other words, there will be jaw-dropping silence before God Almighty. And you will know, amen, that's right. He's saying, let, but the Lord who is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. The ends that I have ordained will come to fruition. And if it seems slow and I'm not going fast enough for you, go back to verse 3. It's going to happen. I will be exalted in all the earth. In stressful situations, God exhorts us to rely on him and to listen. Do you remember the story of the transfiguration? The transfiguration, Jesus, just before violence breaks out in Jesus' life, just before Peter denies Jesus, just, just prior to uh, the second half of Jesus' public ministry, he goes up to a mountain with his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and he meets Moses and Elijah, the transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. And Jesus is glorified into his glorious position, and Peter, James, and John see it, and they're just blown away. And Peter, my guy, he's like, Lord, he speaks up. You know, James and John are kind of quiet. Peter says, oh, Lord, it's great that we're here. I mean, Peter's seen Moses and Elijah. It's a big deal. That's great, Lord, it's great that we're here. And he starts speaking up. I can build, you know, tents here, and I can, I can kind of position things so that we can worship, and, you know, I'll build a couple tents here for us. And, and, and then all of a sudden, so Peter's trying to rush around and, and, and do it all, you know, as he thinks he understands it. And then all of a sudden, a cloud depend, descends down, and a voice comes from that cloud and says, this 
is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He tells Peter, Peter, tranquilo muchacho. You didn't know that was the language of heaven, did you? Tranquilo muchacho. I only know that because Pastor Mark used to say it to me all the time when we were in college. But he says, Peter, God just speaks. And they're trembling with fear. He said, this is my beloved son, Jesus. He's going to be crucified. Violence is going to break out on him. And despite all that, you, I'm pleased with him. And you listen to him. You, this morning. You, 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 you. Listen to him. Amen. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. So a Christian responds to chaos and violence by respectfully asking God questions, listening with expectation, and lastly, praying and worshiping God. I'm almost done here. This last point, I'm going to breeze through it, but it is significant. Because in the end now, in chapter 3, Habakkuk has stopped asking questions. He stopped complaining. Now he's listening. He's, kind of, he's got the message that God is an all-powerful, beautiful God. That he's a righteous and good God. That he's a sovereign God. That he's working things and spinning it and turning it in a way for his purposes and ultimate glory. And now Habakkuk is concerned about three key things. One, he's concerned about revival. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Lord, oh Lord, I have heard thy speech. I've heard you, God, in the first two chapters. I've heard thy speech and I was afraid. I was afraid. Listen, when God speaks... If you have any experience in following God, when he speaks, it can be a very frightening thing. That's another story. But I love the fact that he respects God. It's a big deal. Fearing God's a big deal. Have higher views of God, will you? Stop thinking so highly of yourself and your own way and your own little compartmentalized God. And begin to think bigger of God, higher. So he says, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work, God, in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. God, stir up your works again. Bring us back. Revive us back to the place where we had our first love. Bring us back to that place where we feared your name and saw your works, God. Revive your people. Revive your church. Bring us back to that place. Well, we're back in love with you. That's what revival is. That's what we should be asking God for, that we would turn our hearts and have a first love, that same excitement we had with God when we first came to know him and we were first baptized, and to stir that back up to return back to our first love. And then he's concerned about the glory of God. Verses 4 and 6, chapter 3, his glory, listen to this. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. You connect that dot. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. He just looked and made the nations tremble. Here now in chapter 3, no more questions. He's like, God, stir up your works, revive your people. God, it's about your glory. Brighter than the sunrise, God. Flashes of lightning spin forth from your hands. Oh, no wonder the world is silent before him. Because he will stand and be proven that all his judgments through the beginning of human history to the end were true and right all along. And he loved us enough to give us his son that we would escape the very wrath of God that each one of us apart from him are under. And then he's concerned about praise, and I'll wrap it up with this. Listen to this. This is powerful. You've heard this verse before. But he's concerned about, Habakkuk is concerned about praise over collapse, verses 17 through 19. Praise over collapse. Listen, this is an agricultural community. These are farmers. When farmers experience what I'm about to read to you, they're in trouble. People are going to die the economy is going to break. Listen to what he says. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, 
Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. In other words, this man who's walking by faith, not relying on his own power and strength, is saying, though the economy breaks, there's no food, there's no figs, there's no olives, and though there's a loss of life as a result, and though there's shortages in food and supplies, and though there's violence that plagues the street, still by faith, I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will rejoice and be joyful in the God of my salvation. That is what walking by faith, that's how we respond to violence in our culture. So as the worship team makes their way forward, I want you to do a couple things. This is a heavy message, but also should be an encouraging message to you. So don't get those two mixed up. We have to face pain. And we can't be afraid to be theologians and to process the depravity that's in our world today. And if we don't, we're not being responsible. So what I want you to do as we sing this song is I want you to release. I want you to be honest and just release. If you've been gripped by fear, would you release that this morning? Would you trust that God is sovereign? If you've grown cynical, you've allowed your heart to become crusty, would you let God tenderize that? Would you enter back into the trust of your sovereign God? If Jesus has just been kind of like a pet little side project for you, it's, what I mean by that is your, spiritually, your spirituality doesn't go much deeper than your fish bumper sticker. That's like your big deal. That's like your, your big witnessing tool, your little Jesus bumper sticker. If your spirituality just goes, doesn't go beyond much than that, would you, would you make a, a commitment this morning to say, I, I'm going to go deeper? I need God. See, I need him. I need him. I need him bad. I need him bad. I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I, I don't know where the next mass shooting is going to be. but I want, to, I want my knee to be bowed before God Almighty. I really do. I want to be ready, you see. I don't really mean that. And I want to end well. I want to finish this race well. So I want to go out pouring everything I have in my life for God. Every ounce. Would you do that this morning? Would you, would you just make that decision this morning? See, you had no clue what you were getting into this morning, did you? But now you got to finish it. And, and finishing it isn't just walking out saying, wow, that was a terrible sermon or that was a good sermon. It's, finishing it is saying, here's what I'm going to do about this. And I think for most of it, it's just coming back to God. 100%. Just 100%. Coming back to God. Amen.